Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, as most of you know, my name is David Wilkins. I'm the director of the Center on the Legal Profession, and this is our weekly speaker series in which we bring in amazing people doing amazing things. And our guest today absolutely fits that bill. Uh, this is Sarah Reed, who's now the general counsel of MPM Capital, but just since a month, is that right? Yes, that's right. And in fact, when we first met, she was the general counsel of another important uh, firm called Charles River Partners that some of ventures. you may know. Oh, Ventures, sorry. There's that's another. Those guys have lab rats. Uh, all know. right, okay. <laughs> See, she's also not shy. Uh, and she's uh, one of our own, a member of the class of 1991, where she proudly says she did not know Barack Obama. And she's not the only sadly, person sadly. I've <laughs> ever met from the class of 1991 who admits that. <laughs> So without further ado, Sarah Reed. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. So um, I first want to thank Nathan for picking out this graphic <laughs> image for my talk, because when I saw the invitation for my talk, my talk is about venture capital. So I don't know how Nathan presciently knew this image perfectly fits the morals of the story I want to tell you today. Because I want to begin with talking briefly about how it was that I became uh, the venture capital attorney I am today. Because if you had met me in law school, there was a 0% chance that I would be doing what I'm doing now. 0%. Um, you know the people who come to law school who have this E-Day fix about what they're going to do in law, right? You know, the kid who's grown up in the sailing around the world on a boat and is going to become an expert on law of the seas. How many of you were like that? How many of you came to law school with a very fixed idea about precisely what you wanted to do when you graduate? A few? Nick, Nick's the only one minute? Well, yeah, I mean, there, there were a few of us. Um, and then the others are just like, well, might as well go to law school. I don't know. If we'll figure it out when I'm there. But I knew exactly what I was going to do. Uh, I was the first Harvard undergrad to spend a year uh, on an exchange program in China. I spent a year at Fudan University. And um, after I finished college, I spent a year at the uh, Stanford Center for Chinese Language Study, which was eight hours a day, one-on-one -on -one instruction. And you already had to have five years of Chinese before you went to that school. So by the time I got to Harvard Law School, people were worried about being called on in class. I knew I had a one in a hundred chance. I was chilling. I thought, wow, this is so unstressful versus one-on-one -on -one language drilling all day long. So I came to Harvard Law School knowing for sure that I was going to be a big wheel lawyer in China when I graduated. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, the summer after my first year, so I, I studied all the pragmatic courses like Qing Dynasty Law. Um, I did not touch on the subjects of transactional law, securities regulation, I mean, pff, losers, right, forget it, I'm not going to study that. I pretty much all my optional courses were things relating to China, extremely pragmatic for what I wanted to do. So my 1L summer, I landed my dream job working for the most prestigious US law firm with offices in China and Hong Kong, working for the most acclaimed American lawyer in China, uh, somebody who did have connections to this law school. And what happened is that and I'm not going to, uh, I don't use these words lightly, that person who I worked for was a sexual predator. And that's a harsh term, but it's fair. So that's another, it's a very long story. It's not the subject of my talk today. But that, at that moment, when I had that experience in my job, I suddenly realized this path, these 10,000 hours of Chinese language study that made me, according to Malcolm Gladwell, an expert, this path was not available anymore. It was foreclosed to me. So, well, what was down this path? I had no idea, but I knew I wasn't going to work in China anymore. I couldn't. Um, so I ended up working for a law firm in Boston, 
where I had not uh, had a summer job. And I was extremely fortunate because when I graduated, the economy was in and people were using the R word, recession. It was the recession of the 90s. So I was kind of terrified, uh, but I did get a job at Foley Hoag and felt extremely fortunate to be there. So I went into the litigation department because that's what I saw on TV, right? If I wasn't going to be a lawyer in China, I mean, I was going to be a trial lawyer. So as I'm going along, I'm thinking, well, I do still have this asset that my Chinese is really good and I have all these connections. And how can I leverage that to my advantage as a young associate at a Boston law firm? So I started organizing these um, lunch meetings where anytime there was somebody important from China in Boston, which I would find out about often through my connections in the East Asian Studies Department at Harvard or otherwise, um, I would ask them to come speak at our law firm. And for example, a big coup was we had the US, uh, the Chinese ambassador to the United States come to speak. We had a uh, governor of a very important Chinese province come to speak. Better yet, he spoke no English so that I could stand up there and do simultaneous translation and show my stuff. So this went on for a little while. I had these lunches. And um, the head of the corporate department then approached me in the hallway one day and said, so those lunches you're doing are you know, really great. A lot of our business clients who are doing work in China are thinking about going there, think it's you know, pretty interesting, and they're enjoying it. He said, so, um, he said, so you're in litigation? I said, yeah. He said, do you, see, uh, do you see a lot of Chinese people suing each other? <laughs> and I looked at him astonished. I said, what are you talking about? That's totally culturally <clears throat> antithetical to Chinese people. They don't like to sue each other. And he looked at me and said, you know, bingo? I mean, what are you doing in the litigation department? And uh, the light bulb finally went off. I said, you know, actually, that's kind of a great point. It doesn't really make any sense. It's not compatible with this. China thing. And uh, he said, listen, why don't you come work in the corporate department? <clears throat> now, by that time, I was a fourth year associate. And uh, I said, great, but um, the thing about litigation is it never ends. Your cases go on for years and years and years. And it's very hard to get yourself out of the case when you're the associate who's most familiar with all the documents. So I got out in the only way I could, which was by taking maternity leave after I had my first <laughs> child. Uh, because when I had to take maternity leave, not had to, when I took maternity leave, um, clearly I had to get out from under all my cases and assign them over to someone else. So the day I came back from maternity leave, uh, I was an associate in the corporate department. Um, I was essentially a first year associate, but as far as my clients knew, I was being built out at a fifth year associate rate, and they actually thought I knew something. Um, and one year later, uh, a client for whom I had really had the most interaction, a corporate client, had been doing a lot of work for them, uh, called me in and offered me a job as their general counsel. It was a public company, and they'd never had a general counsel. And you might imagine I was secretly horrified, <laughs> frightened. <laughs> you know, dumbfounded. I just said, oh, well, thank you very much. Um, let me get back to you. And went home and told my husband. I said, it's obviously ridiculous. I mean, because and how do I tell them I can't take the job? Because I don't know what I'm doing. I am just making this stuff up. And my husband gave me the excellent career advice, which was, um, you know, by the time you think you're ready for this job, um, it's not going to be available for you. So. I think that's just, in general, very good career advice for women, advice that we do get these days, which is, you know, if we always wait until we feel we're ready for that job promotion, we were probably ready a while ago, but sometimes you just have to reach for it. Um, so I did, and I took the job, and um, it was great. It all worked out. Uh, and so from there is where I moved to VC. So now someday I was a corporate lawyer kind of thinking, I wish I'd taken that securities regulation class, <laughs> especially because it was a public company. Um, little, little anxiety provoking when I'm uh, responsible for filing the K's and Q's, but 
if it got done, we stayed out of hot water. Um, and so I stayed there for five years. And by the end of that five years, I knew what I was doing as a corporate lawyer. And also, I felt I had developed kind of an in-house legal department from scratch because my company hadn't had one. I developed a basic toolkit of the documents you needed, the processes. So when I decided I wanted to move on and do something else new and different and challenging, I had the idea, well, I am going to develop kind of what I'm going to call a law department in a box. Back then it was literally, and I still have it, it was a three ring binder. It was this huge three ring binder with all the form documents that companies need. Um, and my idea was I would peddle this to venture capital firms and say, listen, every single one of the startups you finance is going to need this set of documents. And why should they go pay the big law firms each time to reinvent the wheel? I could kind of come in there, boom, and help them and get them you know, all these documents in place, their stock option plan, their NDAs, their beta agreements, all those things. They're, show them how to do corporate minutes, and they're off and running. Um, and it was a little hard to get any traction on trying to find that job. Um, for reasons that, that will become clear to you when I talk a little bit more about the economics of how venture capital firms work. Um, but what happened was I was looking for this job. And the reason I was interested in VC was it happened to be the height of the internet bubble. And everybody was interested in VC. Uh, and one day I opened up the Mass Lawyers Weekly and I saw this tombstone ad on the back of it that said, you know, VC firm looking for lawyer to provide legal services to its portfolio companies. And I just went, oh, I didn't, I, it was a blind ad. I emailed them. I said, yo, I said, I have this, you know, I invented this job. <laughs> I have this thing so figured out. I don't know who you are, but come talk to me because I'm totally on top of this. I've been actually trying to convince venture firms. And if you don't hire me soon, I'm going to go tell all your competitors what a good idea you have and tell them how to do it. So anyway, that turned out to be CRV. Um, so that's where I ended up on this road. And so the first moral of my story of my talk today is to use a catchphrase of honest venture capitalists. It's better to be lucky than to be smart. And that's how I ended up in VC Law. Um, and looking back on what I might have been, as managing partner of a law firm in China, I do have very close friends who now do that. And I have to say, I mean, I, I think they have in many respects, you know, wonderful and interesting lives, but I honestly and sincerely don't envy that or feel, you know, gosh, any regrets. I really wish I were doing that. I feel it was, you know, Felix Culpa, the fortunate fall in a way that brought me to where I am now. Um, so my second theme of my talk, also presciently um, illustrated by this slide, Nathan. Talk about emotional intelligence. He traded one email and he knew. He intuited everything I was going to say. My second theme is, here is the great thing about being a lawyer. You get to go to places where you have no legitimate right to be and learn things that you would never expect to learn. And that is really um, fantastic. I like to think of it as working in your discomfort zone, which we now understand from both neuroscience and exercise physiology. That is a really great place to be, right? That is where you make improvements, in your discomfort zone. <clears throat> so again, looking back on the person I was at law school, science and technology, life sciences, are you kidding me? Me? Right. This is the point in the talk where I'm supposed to say, my high school math and science teachers would be so proud of me that I ended up working in technology and life sciences. Well, my high school math and science teachers would never remember me. Okay, my only objective was to stay below the radar, just get through the class. Okay, so I mean, and that was my last formal academic brush with science and math was in high school, to be clear. So it truly is remarkable. And it's because I'm a lawyer and because I have this great credential that I went to Harvard Law School 
that I'm able to do what I do now and kind of keep my head barely above water on the science and technology piece. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, venture capital. Does anyone know kind of roughly how old venture capital is as an industry? Do you guys have any guesses how long it's been around? Yeah. Early 80s or so? Exactly. So there was, so it's really new, right? It's a lot younger than I am, for the record. Don't, maybe if you're bad at math like that, it'll take you a while to figure it out. Um, in 1979, there was a change in ERISA regulation. Do you guys know what ERISA stands for? If you don't study it in law school, by the way, I think, I, I, I think it's probably the dullest area of law, just my personal opinion. But uh, Employee Retirement Income Security Act, right? It's the law that guards uh, widow and orphans' pension plans. And prior to 1979, ERISA fiduciaries were not allowed to invest in very speculative, risky investments like venture capital. And after 1979, the law changed so that they could invest up to 10% of those pension assets in venture funds. That really broke everything open for venture. Um, today, about 20% of all the dollars invested in venture come from pension plans. So that was a game changer. My own old firm, Charles River Ventures, was founded. There were a few firms around prior to this change in ERISA. Uh, CRV was founded in 1970. But prior to this change in regulation, they were investing in super exciting, cutting edge companies like Chuck E. Cheese. You guys know Chuck E. Cheese? Yeah, OK, so that was, that was what venture investing was. You know, restaurant chains with big fuzzy mice running around, stuff like that. And, um, so anyway, 1979, chain, like, yeah, it's interesting, like many, many financial industries, it was created by a change in regulation, right? Suddenly there was this opportunity there. Um, and so as I said, the moment in time that I joined CRV was uh, just at the moment in time when the tech bubble was kind of about to roll over the edge of the cliff, but it hadn't done that yet. That's why I was fortunate to get my job. CRV had this idea that they were going to build out an incubator, essentially, and provide services for all their portfolio companies. Because everybody was too busy to set up their own PCs or find real estate or worry about their legal documents. They were trying to be the biggest company in that space fastest. And, and go public. Um, so at that time when I joined CRV, uh, there were over a thousand venture capital firms. Everybody wanted to be in the game. Uh, and today, there are fewer than half that number of VC firms. And people think there's going to be a further washing out of a bunch of firms. And I think that's probably true. Um, so my job is also a relatively rare one. I mean, the numbers just don't support uh, most venture capital firms having an in-house counsel. S the last year for which I could find data on the average venture fund size was uh, 2010. I think it's probably still roughly accurate. Do you guys want to guess what the average venture fund size was? Dollars under management? Any, any idea what it might be, a range? Go ahead, guess. It's 150 million. That's a lot of money to me, but it's not a lot of money for, it's not a huge amount of money for um, making investments. It's relatively small. And so that size of fund is not really one where in house counsel makes sense. So um, if you look at the universe of firms that make over 10 investments a year, now you're starting to think, OK, at least in terms of their uh, investment rate, their investment pace, now maybe there's enough work there. And then you've got to separately look at the fund size to support in-house counsel. But firms that make over 10 investments a year, there are fewer than 100 <coughs> firms. And when I got my job, the first thing I did, it was also the first thing I did when I became general counsel at a public company was I immediately tried to find other people who were already doing it. 
who had a clue, right? Networking, um, who could help me out. And so when I was hired at CRV, I really, you know, scoured around looking. I found two other general counsels at VC firms at that time. Uh, I think they're the only two who had that position for longer than I did. They were both in California. They're both still very good friends of mine. They both still work in venture. So we started a group. We started a kind of self-help peer group, a networking group. There were three of us. And I today continue to be kind of the organizer of that group. We actually physically meet once a year. Now there are more than 50 people in the group. That also includes um, lawyers at strategic venture funds. Strategic means Intel Capital, Motorola. Uh, some companies have their own venture capital <coughs> firms. So it includes the folks who run the legal function at those funds. And I think that's about as big as we're going to get. I mean, I can name for you the firms that um, don't have in-house counsel. Uh, Sequoia is probably the most well-known one that has decided not to have in-house counsel. Um, they probably never will change their mind about that. Um, Kleiner Perkins was one of the last holdouts they did get. Well, they've also had a little litigation trouble, which if you read the New York Times and, and my, buddy, uh, my buddy Paul, who works there now, I think was really hired. That made them change their mind about having in-house counsel. But so what I'm saying is, you know, another reason I feel so fortunate to have this job is it's not really a job. I could, if I'd come to Harvard Law School planning, like I want to be general counsel at a venture capital firm, right? My, you know, your odds would be a lot better of being a player in the NBA, right? Like, like 350 to 450 slots, something like that, right? So it's not. <laughs> It's not a job you can really plan and have a career trajectory. This is kind of what I want to do. Um, and the other people, my friends who work at these other firms, you know, most of them got their jobs coming out of law firms where they worked a lot with that venture capital firm um, and doing sort of related, related work. Um, <clears throat> So let me talk a little bit about the, the fundamentals of our industry, the way it works, for those of you who aren't familiar. So how do, how do we make money in venture capital? Maybe you know, some of you have taken that. It's OK to answer even if you've taken the VC class. How do we make money in venture capital? Anybody know? Ideas? Go ahead, Nick. You charge a management fee for the assets under management, and you get a carry on the profits from the investments. Right, so the lingo in our industry is carry. Hey, how you doing, Zach? Carry is um, you get a percentage of the profits. So let's say we raise $100 million. As Nick said, we get a percentage of the assets under management every year for investing those assets. And guess what? We get that money whether we do a good job, a bad job, whether we don't even make any investments. We can take that money every year. I mean, in theory, if you wanted to raise one fund and not be in the business again. You could raise the fund, do nothing, make zero investments, take the management fee, at the end of 10 years say, you know what, sorry, I didn't see anything good. And go, you could, that's the way the legal documents work. Uh, and then if you invest that 100 million and you make 200 million, after you give the investors back their money, you get to keep a percentage of the profits of the excess. And that percentage ranges usually from 20 to 25%. And the management fees range from 2% to 2.5%. The very, very couple firms, 2.5% is rare. So maybe more like 2 to 2 and a quarter. Um, so, you know, VC firms that have um, lawyers are going to have at least one fund that's at least 350 million in assets roughly that's that's pretty much the typical size of a early stage VC fund that's the size that investors are looking for for whatever reason they think that's kind of the sweet spot 350 million so 2% a year do the math what do we get per year they went to law school come on guys <laughs> huh? seven. yeah seven million dollars a year Pretty nice work. 10 years in a row. Sometimes you have a ramp down in management fees. Sometimes you just collect it for the first five and then it <coughs> tails down. But okay, so you're okay, so you're kind of doing the math right now. Maybe you have your pencil out. So we have about five partners typically. 
then you've got a lot of other junior staff, and we've got administrators. We have an office in San Francisco and Boston. We have general counsel. This gets to my point about why, in the early days, people were reluctant to hire general counsels. Everything comes out of that 2%. Okay, you've you got to pay all your overhead, you've got to pay all your staff, and the money that's left over is called partner bonuses. <laughs> right? So when you hire a general, every hire you make, the guy who's hiring you, you are eating into his bonus. Okay, so you have to make their lives better to justify your salary. But anyway, so $7 million might now not seem like such an impressive number to have to pay for all those things. Um, but here's how it really works. The funds are layered, right? Okay, so the, if, you're, if you're in the unhappy position of just, it's your first fund, okay, whatever, you have to make do with the money there. But if you've raised your first fund and it does modestly well, you have some promising investments, what do you do? You go out and you raise another fund. And you can't wait 10 years, you can't run that whole fund to ground the term, the legal term of these funds is 10 years because the investment period, right, if you, the way it works is the first three to four years we take the capital and we deploy it in the companies that we find. And we, have, we save some capital, we keep it on the sidelines because those companies, are, we know we, when we invest, in fact the investors have to make, you know, say to all their partners, is this going to have a B round? Is it going to have a C round? Is it going to have a D round? You have to kind of guess and what you think the company's future trajectory will look like and how much money you need to put on the sidelines from the fund so that that's put aside and we have it available. So within the first three years, we've actually deployed the money or it's sitting there on the sidelines because we know we'll need it for those companies in the out years. So after three to four years, we're done with the money. Even if it's not actually used, it's reserved. Right? And so we're not going to just sit there and, you know, now, now we need more money. There are more good companies that are coming in because they've seen we've done well, we've been helpful to these companies. So we have to raise another fund. So you typically raise funds in three to four year cycles. So you've got, so we have this fund and it's already drawn, you know, three years of management fees. Year four, I raise another one. So now I have multiple depending on where the funds are, when they started, I have multiple fee streams layered in. This means that firms that have been around for a while and have a lot of funds can make a lot of money on management fees alone. Uh, this is no longer the dirty secret of venture capital. It's, the, um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's out there, it's public information. In fact, there's a really excellent paper on the misalignment between venture capital investors and their own underlying investors, their limited partners who put money in their funds, the pension plans, the Harvard Endowment, the Mayo Clinic, the Metropolitan Museum, this big um, misalignment in economic interests. Because the point is um, the venture capital firms can make a really nice income without actually having any successful exits, just on the management fee once you start layering in those funds. So I recommend that paper to you. It's, it's by, by Diane Mulcahy, uh, who works at the Kaufman Foundation. Now you hear them on NPR, the Kaufman Foundation for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And they're big investors in venture capital. And she went back and did this really thorough analysis because she had access to the data because they had invested in all the greatest funds and they've been doing it for a long time because of their own mission and mandate involving entrepreneurship. Um, and the title of her paper is, uh, We Have Seen the Enemy and It Is Us. It is the Kaufman Foundation. Because we keep plowing money back into these firms that are just, you know, taking our money and using it for management fees and not really producing any great returns. Um, and so there's the industry is a little bit broken. And uh, her conclusions are all very sound. And, and basically, the top 25% of VC firms, the question is, who are the top 25%? There's a little bit of you know, shift in that. But they make money for their investors. Um, and the rest really don't. So um, 
the question is how much more of a washout will there be in venture capital? Uh, will the non-performing funds go away? Or A, will hope spring eternal? B, a lot of pensions and endowments feel like you know, they do their asset allocation and they need to be in some risky assets. A slice of it needs to be in high risk assets. And hey, guess what? They can't get into Sequoia or Andreessen Horowitz. They just can't, right? I mean, their funds aren't that big. And so they think, well, I want to be in venture. OK, I'll go to a second tier person. And so the, the, the dynamics get perpetuated. Um, and finally, the last time I'm going to refer to this slide, the last time I took a new fork in the road uh, was when, just a month ago, I left tech to go to a life sciences firm. And I am super, super enthusiastic about this new path and the future of life sciences. I feel like life sciences today is where the VC industry was at the beginning of the bubble. When, wow, everything was breaking open. I mean, the internet, this you know, shiny new thing, all these new possibilities. Um, the things that are going on in life sciences today are incredibly exciting. There have been uh, advances and breakthroughs in immunology, genetics, molecular biology um, that have allowed us to target diseases and biological systems that were previously inaccessible. Um, I recommend to you, I mean, if you have any interest in it, uh, there's a great article by Jerome Groupman in The New Yorker within the past six months talking about fundamental breakthroughs in oncology. And in fact, he focused on a company in Massachusetts, a company that I regret to say, MPM looked at the investment and passed on it. It happens, but we, MPM also has investments in related areas. There's just an awful lot going on in oncology that's it's exciting to me intellectually, and it's also, it's very motivating. When I go, you know, when I started out at CRV and tech, people did still have this idea that we were investing in things that were going to change the world. I have to say, now in tech, I don't think people really have that ambition anymore. Um, Twitch TV? I mean, it's just personally hard for me to get really excited about stuff like that. Uh, I sit in the presentations at NPM and, you know, they're all talking about rare diseases, non-rare diseases that we're working on trying to cure, and it's incredibly exciting and motivating. Um, one of the things that really persuaded me to join NPM in particular was that they built the company that uh, developed a drug called Sovaldi, which I think is one of the biggest public health breakthroughs since penicillin. Sovaldi is the first drug that can actually cure hepatitis C, which is a major worldwide uh, public health problem. So, you know, I can get out of bed every day for stuff like that. Very exciting to me. Um, I want to touch on a couple differences that I've observed just in my first month. There really are a lot of structural differences in um, life sciences and tech. And it's interesting when people talk about VC in the newspaper, on TV, just casually, they're really talking about tech. And people forget it. it things are different in life sciences. One big difference I've observed just right away is that re most recently in tech deals, they're very competitive. Right? It's very hard to get into good deals. A lot of bidders, valuations of the companies going up. The way that you make yourself attractive as a venture capital investor is by promising the company that you will stay out of their hair, right? No, I'm not going to leave you guys totally alone. You guys got it, right? I mean, this is the, this is the world that um, Google and Zuckerberg built, right? They have this super voting stock. They have control of the company forever. It's like, I'll take your money. Thank you very much, David, but you know. Please just leave me alone. So at CRV, it was always kind of like, well, you know, we'll just we'll keep our distance. We promise not to get in your hair. Uh, that's a selling point, right? We're going to respect you guys and let you just run the show. You know what you're doing. Now, in life sciences, there is a tremendous paucity of people who can operate companies. 
who can actually execute on a scientific idea. So the people who we invest in view what we're bringing to them, namely our ability to provide them with a whole management team slotted in on top of the science project, people who've taken something from a science project to market before, people who know how to get it through FDA, everything else, we can put in the whole team. They view that as a tremendous benefit. Please, please come help me. It's not at all just you know stay away from me. Um, and that also, and there's also a huge difference in valuations. Life sciences is just simply not overheated the way that tech is. Um, for me, and I, I did leave CRV before this article came out. But for me, this was really ultimate confirmation. This is from the Wall Street Journal on October 23rd. Uh, talking of the headline as hedge funds add to venture bounty. Right, okay, when the hedgies, when you see the hedgies coming, it's time to look for the exit doors, in my view. A quote from the article, naming one of these hedge funds, Maverick, with roughly nine billion under management, is among a growing number of Wall Street firms that are trying to get a piece of the lofty valuations being achieved by startups in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. This is tech, again. They think they're just, they talk about VC. This is not life sciences. But I, you know, as a tech, I am so happy as a $350 million life sciences fund not to be competing against some guy who has nine billion in assets and is willing to write a big check and you know, have, have zero management intervention. Um, so um, I, I think that's, that's all I have to say. And uh, again, thank you to Nathan for providing me the <laughs> graphic <laughs> stimulus for the various morals of my story. I feel like I need to end by standing here, and I wish my dress needs to be there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'd love, to, I'd love to take your questions, and I hope I didn't talk Please. too long. Floor is open. Perfect, Sarah. Floor is open. Don't be shy. This is a fantastic opportunity. Sarah, the risk in life sciences is different than tech, right? I mean, venture capitalists, you can you can kind of predict where the, the, the risks are, but life sciences, particularly with these doctors coming up with their own sort of you're an investor in a venture deal, these these tests and these whether they're gonna get FDA approval, sure. all sorts of hurdles that you don't sure. typically expect. I'm actually really glad you asked that question because um, Life sciences investing to the general public um, is still encumbered by a lot of kind of, they're now myths of what it used to be like, and it's changed radically in the last 10 years. I mean, 10 years ago, the reason life sciences is still generally in the you know, public imagination and most fund managers who don't really know anything about, I mean, so these are you know, pension fund and stuff, they don't really pay that much attention to life sciences because 10 years ago, it was incredibly expensive. Right, you had to get the thing through all the clinical trials. It would cost $100 million. You'd have to make a bet of $100 million to get all the way through the clinical trials, and then maybe it doesn't work, and it's super binary. Right, so it's pretty unattractive. Totally agree. So what has changed? Tons of things have changed. Number one, uh, universe, the places where we get our investments, ideas, um, Harvard University is one place that we partner with a lot, They've gotten a lot more sophisticated, and they no longer turn over and look for investment in science projects. Hmm. They've taken it a lot further. So it's already been de-risked more on their end. Um, number two, in the past 10 years, all the big pharma companies have completely hollowed out their R&D functions. Uh, well, more their R functions. And they're relying on venture capital-backed companies to occupy that space. And so something that's very interesting to me about the way our deals are structured, and all of our deals, as far as I know, are structured like this. Instead of viewing the way in tech we would, like we would never you know, partner with Google from day one because they might be a buyer, but we'd like to have a bidding war and we don't want them to get too close. We want to kind of keep, there's always that dance with strategic investors, too. You kind of want to keep them at arm's length. But 
we partner, we pick the most suitable big pharma company among the ones that we work closely with because, hey, you know what? They have so much expertise. Let's say this is an oncology company. So we partner with them from day one. They will give the startup access to their library of molecules, something which otherwise the startup would never have access to. So they provide them all kinds of free services and benefits and advice. And from day one, we structure the deal so that if we achieve different milestones, and they're milestones way before demonstrating you know, efficacy in human beings, then there are different buyout options at different prices. So it's tremendously de-risked for us. It's, you know, it's, it works for them. They don't have to fund the development themselves. Um, so it's, it's a lot less risky and less, it's similar to tech, you know, the price, the whole uh, cost of running a company has come down. And the same thing has happened in life sciences. I mean, every, the clinical trials are all outsourced. A lot of our companies are essentially virtual. They have a management team, but all the different functions are being performed on an outsourced, cost-effective basis by third-party uh, providers and consultants. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. You're, you're absolutely right because that group that I was talking about is more the, 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 that I kind of organized is more heavily weighted towards um, tech firms. Although there are some life sciences firms. I guess two answers. One is it'll depend on if I'm right and if in the next 10 years people do really get excited about life sciences as an asset class um, and move money there away from tech, then there'll be more firms that get created the same as there were in tech. Number two, there are just generally more opportunities for lawyers because um, for example, we have on staff a, a patent attorney who's really expertise in, uh, expert in um, life sciences. And he also gets kind of seconded out to our portfolio companies and works with them on their patent strategy. So any life sciences firm could always use a patent attorney uh, on staff. Yeah. So, yeah. I, so, oh, I, yeah, so I had a question just in terms of understanding your uh, kind of the day to day functions of your yes. role and how much uh, your role gets involved in actually thinking about the litigation risks, that sort of thing, when you're uh, putting money into a company, or how much of it is just once the money is going in, you're dealing with that. Just what, what's the role exactly? I guess is what I'm doing. I don't know this area very well. Sure, sure. Um, so I'll be able to answer that a little better, particularly as to NPM a little later. But one of the things I, the, the litigation risks when you're a VC investor um, tend to arise in the context where you might be doing something that's not fair to the other stockholders. And there are recently a number of cases in the Delaware Chancery Court involving venture capital investors. If you look 10 years ago, you'd find no cases. You really wouldn't. They just completely stayed out of court. They, you know, they just didn't get in trouble. Um, and all of these cases are around the theme of the VCs really not playing fair and square and taking an unfair advantage for themselves. You know, true or not, I don't know, but this is the way the facts are positioned by the Chancery Court. Um, and so I, of course, keep abreast of those cases. And if we're in a fact pattern where I think, uh-oh, it's starting to look something vaguely like one of these cases, for example, the board is controlled. There's, there's, let's say there's four people on the board. There's the CEO and there's three investors. And uh, the company is struggling. It's running out of money. It hasn't hit one of those proof points yet. Do we want to put in more money? As we say, do we want to play another card and see if it's going to hit that proof point? Or do we want to just walk away at this point? We kind of bring our hands and go, OK, we're going to put in more money. It may be a bad idea. And we're going to have some onerous terms around that money. 
right? We were taking more ownership, something like that. Now, it all makes perfect sense when you're sitting on the board, right? Like, you know, this goddamn management team, they completely screwed it up. They didn't tell me for the last minute they were running out of money. They didn't hit their proof points. They left me in a terrible position. It's an agonizing decision. I have to really go out on a limb to get my partners to write another check. They say, what are you talking about another check? This company said they need more money. Okay, so you go through all of that. You write the check. You give them the money. They hit the proof point. They do really well. Um, you now own way more of the company because that was the pound of flesh you took. You got increased ownership. Now they rise from the ashes. They look great. And the other stockholders whose holdings were diluted as a result of you putting that extra money in, those are the plaintiffs. And on that fact pattern that I just told you, they may prevail. So I'm just, when I hear, you know, certain, there are certain little triggers, red flags, you go, okay, wait a minute, guys, hang on, you know, let me just tell you some things you can do going into this to just create a record that's not going to look really bad to the Delaware Chancery Court. You know, maybe this is a time, usually you take very sketchy board minutes. Maybe this is a time where you have a little more detail in those board minutes and explain. Like, actually, the company had no other options. No one else was willing to write a check. We went and asked other people. They were desperate. They were up against the wall. They were lucky to get money from us. We asked the other people if they wanted to contribute. They said, no, you know, those kind of facts. So that's the kind of but thing. But I think to, to answer Nick's question a little bit differently, Sarah's role in-house at a venture firm can be a nightmare and a blessing to outside counsel. Because if you're not if you're not adhering to the covenants, she represents the wallet, and you want her to be your best friend, and you may represent the company, and the company's doing everything it can to stay alive. But Sarah can come in and say, you know, we're not happy. You missed a reporting covenant. You missed a debt service covenant ratio, or you're you you've just defaulted on something. It may not be material, but I'm going to tell my guys, you're not going to get round B, or you're going to do a cram down. And that's when everybody's going to get diluted. And here, by the way, we fully won't be representing the company anymore. We're going to bring in another counsel. So she has a tough job, but one of the best jobs, I suppose, <laughs> that position. Nick, did you have a question? Yes, you said that um, the universities are de-risking the, the technology, the science, a little bit more. Does that mean that your early funding rounds are a little bit higher valuation? or? Mm -mm. No, the valuations are still quite, I like to say, reasonable, right? Because I'm in a venture capital firm in life sciences. Um, we were recently discussing a super hot deal. I wish I could say what it was. It has something to do with Harvard. It's a really, I mean, it's so exciting. And people were really upset that our valuation might go, it might go into the lowest possible double digits. People that yeah, they were like, wow, that's setting a terrible precedent. And I mean, I'm coming from tech. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. I guess, but, I mean, Harvard's not demanding or demanding more from you as far as funding because they've, you know, taken it on to de-risk this. No, that part hasn't really changed. The valuations are still pretty, you know, what I'd call reasonable. They're still like the valuations you used to have in tech, which is for a Series A, it's single digit. Because it's totally risky. It's just still basically an idea. That's not true in tech anymore, though. That it's single digit for Series A, not at all. Yeah? Um, just going off that, what do you think is going to happen to the tech bubble and to evaluations? Do you think they'll keep at what it is now, or do you think at some point they'll follow the I mean, in a small sense, I voted with my feet, but I am no financial analyst. <laughs> Probably, it's, if, if you're smart, it's best to look at the path that I've gone down and go down the opposite one. I don't know, but um, I, I really have no idea. I mean, I do just, you know, it does look awfully frothy to me in tech, and, and there's a lot of competition for deals. Um, and, and what the entrepreneur is interested in is, you know what? Who's going to give me the most money at the highest valuation and just stay away from me? And that's all it's about. So that sets up a kind of bad dynamic. Sir, have you seen and how do you feel, if you have, about doctors investing in their own technology? So, so you have these tech venture offices at Beth Israel and MGA, sure, yeah, yeah. And these doctors have the right under their agreements to invest in their own science. Somewhere. I actually can't. I don't know about that, Derek. I mean, the, my the, again, from based on one month in, I think they're pretty 
severely limited on the equity they can take. I mean, that's kind of one of the issues is, you know, we want them pretty motivated and engaged, but they're limited by their own institution's rules about their equity stake. And their TVO offices, but they do yeah. invest. Separately, aside from that, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure they would feel, again, I'm just thinking of this recent case, like, you know what, I just invested 15 years of my life on one experiment, essentially. And, you know, I'll take my free equity up to the limit that I'm allowed to by the TLO. But <laughs> asking to put more money in, I mean, they really have. They've thrown their lives into it. So they already have a big bet on it, personally. Yeah. Yeah, I saw on your bio page that you use a treadmill desk and me being who I am, I know that I'll never last in an office job unless I can use a treadmill desk. Yeah. And I'm wondering how... Thank you for talking to me about my I've... favorite subject, my treadmill desk. <laughs> it's it's waiting for someone to ask me that question. Yeah. And I know I'm going to want to get one shortly after I graduate. How do you go about bringing this up with your coworkers? Well, I have the most really difficult political situation in my new office with the treadmill desk. It couldn't get worse because I've had a treadmill desk for, I don't know, 10 years. I've had it for a really long time. Super, super early. Got, the reason I got a treadmill desk is uh, our investor was Mayo Clinic at CRV and the head of Mayo Clinic did this research that showed, you know, throwing yourself in the gym for an hour a day is good, but constant movement throughout the day is actually better. A small level of more continual motion. So, I mean, it was easy at CRV. I was like, I mean, I got, I paid for it myself, and I said, hey, come on, our investor, the Mayo Clinic, you know, endorses this. Let's 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 represent here. Let's let's uptake all their research. But then I moved my treadmill desk over to MPM, and I had actually not seen the office before. I had it shipped over. I go into the office. It's an open office plan. <laughs> Okay, it's like a trading floor. It's a totally open office plan. Everyone's looking at me like, you don't want the treadmill desk? I'm like, yes, and I get on the treadmill desk, and it beeps, and it makes all these noises that I never noticed before. Every time you get on and off, it beeps. And I'd say by my third day of work, I was the most hated person in the firm, for sure, because the treadmill desk. I mean, it was terrible. People would just be staring daggers at me. And so my fourth day at work, I actually had to be gone for the whole day. Came back on the fifth day. There were two people who kind of liked me, who were the IT guys. And uh, came back on the fifth day at work, and the IT guys said, you know what? They said, we did you a solid. That day, yesterday, when you were out, we actually disassembled your whole treadmill desk. And we took parts of the ceiling tiles, the acoustic ceiling tiles. God, I love these IT guys. And we took them into little bits, and we jammed them all inside your treadmill desk. And we soundproofed it, and they did. And it works. And now I'm just, you know, I have a lot more friends at the firm, so it's a lot quieter. Um, but I'll tell you what. When you actually, you, you have to work with the situation you have. When you're in a situation, we'll strategize, because you can't have a you have to have a tactical plan depending on where you're working and your boss. And here's an even better thing at my new job. So that was day five. By the beginning of week three, guess what shows up right next to my treadmill desk? The founder of our firm got a treadmill desk <laughs> right next to me. So it's, it's spreading. It's spreading. <laughs> well, I know it runs into class. I want to give Sarah a round of applause. Before. Thank you.